And hello, everybody. This is Bill Razor Rayback, and you are on the Sports Planet. Uh, we are going to be talking to several people tonight. We're going to be a little bit fluffy. We'll have some, some fun stuff. We are going to talk about the best uniforms all time in baseball. And I guarantee you when Greg Henning's on, I'm just going to give you a little secret tip on this. I'm sure the New York Yankees will probably be the best team. Are those, are those are the uniforms that they just paint on? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> those what, are the best of all time. Whatever era you want to use, right? Oh, wait, no, I'm thinking uh, Earl Smalley. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, there is a, a woman's uh, professional football league, uh, kind of like the, um, the uh, Legends League, that I saw where... It, instead of having, they have equipment, but they use body paint for the rest of it. So I know how that's going to work out, especially when they start sweating. Well, there was there, there was actually a Swedish volleyball team where their uniforms were painted on, and the paint doesn't run usually if they're perspiring. So, yeah. uh, you know, it's designed to, to be, uh, I guess, moisture resistant. Yeah, I'd like to be there to see that. See, I, <laughs> see if it actually is. I, I would like to see the lawsuit that would be lodged if uh, if uh, it didn't work and uh, they were checked on. You know, it. Sherwin Williams could probably get sued for that or something. So. <laughs> yeah, I don't think it's Sherwin Williams that would, uh, provides that pain. Or Dutch it. Boy or one of those, whoever it might <laughs> yeah, be. Yeah, the Dutch Boy. Probably is that the, the one with it, the finger in the yeah. dike? <laughs> <laughs> it's probably the Dutch Stop play. the perspiration. <laughs> <laughs> it won't stop. Okay. Well, this has gone south very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, <clears throat> but we're going to talk about the best uniforms of all time. And, I, you know, there's baseball has had some color through its age, ages. Um, it, they've been pretty bland. And then there's been periods of time when they've been pretty creative. And uh, so it'll be interesting having Tim Fillinger on in this debate myself and Greg Henning, um, to see how that goes. And then a little bit later here, uh, as a matter of fact, in a few minutes, we'll have Zach Ray back on, and we're going to talk a little bit about Ohio State basketball. Of course, the Buckeyes hired a new basketball coach, and then uh, you know how that's going to affect Ohio State. And then we'll take a look at the Ohio State football recruiting, and if you haven't been keeping up on it, this Ohio State class right now with only 11 signees is on pace to be better than the one that they just had this past year. I mean, the Buckeyes, Urban is out there just killing it, getting the best players uh, all across the country. Like Urban once said at a clinic I attended, we go to get number one draft choices no matter where they're at. And I know, you know, there's people in Ohio that think all the best football players all come out of the state of Ohio. Well, there's a lot of good football players come out of the state of Ohio, but there's a lot of good football players in Texas and Florida and California and Arizona and Pennsylvania, and, and Urban is going to find those players, and he's going to make them Ohio State Buckeyes. And in doing so, he will keep our program in lockstep with Alabama as far as being one of the top two programs in the country on a, on a year-to-year basis. Uh, of course, a little news in college football is we had Bob Stoops step down as the head coach at Oklahoma after 18 years. Uh, you know, I'm, I guess Bob Stoops, I, in perspective, I've listened to a lot of uh, interviews here in the last couple of weeks. And my initial impression was is that Bob Stoops was somewhat overrated uh, as the coach at Oklahoma. Uh, I don't know how many years we've seen Oklahoma come in picked to win the national championship, to be in the national title game, and it was a big swing and a miss. Actually, the joke is when Oklahoma's not picked to be in the top ten is the years that they will be in the top ten. But I think what we saw with Bob Stoops, <clears throat> he won one national championship. He played in three other games for the national title and, uh, and really did a pretty good job. He's beaten uh, Ohio State. I'm sorry, he did not beat Ohio State, but he did beat Alabama. He's beaten LSU. He's beaten some of the powers that are out there. He's taken on all comers, and, and he did take on Ohio State this past year. And, uh, you know, so hats off to Bob Stoops. He says he wants to spend uh, more time with his family. And, you know, I can commend anybody that wants to do that, to uh, invest more time in the people that really count in their life. So, you know, um, he will be missed. He did a great job. 
at Oklahoma. Lincoln Riley will be taking over. Uh, some big shoes to fill. And, and, you know, Rick, I would tell you, I think with Bob Stoops, he saw a lot of good players go to the draft this year. Uh, uh, Samaji, uh, Piran, of course, um, the... Uh, you know, they just had a ton of kids leave, and I think that uh, Stoops probably just didn't want to go through that rebuilding process. And so uh, Lincoln Riley now steps into those shoes, and he has been the offensive coordinator there. So we'll see how that works out for Oklahoma. Um, and, of course, the NBA Finals, if he, hadn't, if he hadn't been paying attention, was last week. Of course, it ends about five weeks too late. Um, the NBA should be wrapping things up at the end of April. However... Uh, that is not the case. And, of course, we have to put on uh, this long playoff, which we call cash in the pocket uh, for the owners series. And it came down to the Cleveland Cavaliers and Golden State Warriors. Of course, Golden State won 5-1 to one, or 4-1. to one. And I am still not quite sure where we are with the whole thing with the uh, Warriors and Cavaliers. I think that uh, Tyron Lue, Deserves a lot of the credit for the Cavaliers. Uh, and, and Golden State may have, uh, have won this series, no matter what would have happened. I think this series could have went four, uh, four games of two, four games of three, with a little bit of better uh, coaching. And, and we did not see that happen. I think uh, game three should have went to the Cavaliers. Cleveland should have went back to Golden State at the very worst, two to two, which if even if Golden State wins, it comes back to Cleveland for Game Six, and maybe the Cavs pull that out, and we send it to Game Seven again. Of course, if some butts were candy and nuts, everybody would be fine and dandy, and that wasn't the case. But there will be some changes in Cleveland, and will it be LeBron leaving to go to L.A., or will Cleveland be able to push some salary cap numbers around to be able to bring in some new players to make the Cavaliers? Uh, yeah, let's face it, they need some fixes and if they don't get those fixes and one that they don't need don't tell me that Kevin Love needs to go Kevin Love had his best season since he was playing for Minnesota when he was a perpetual all-star you don't if you can't replace Kevin Love with somebody that's better than Kevin Love then you better not be getting rid of Kevin Love. You better keep Kevin Love because Kevin Love played lights out for most of the season. He was a component with him and Kyrie and LeBron, they need to add to that because it's the super teams now, like it was. You know, people think this is a uh, Johnny-come-lately thing. The Lakers were like that in the 80s. The Celtics were like that in the 80s. Back in the 60s, the Celtics and Lakers. I mean, <clears throat> we've seen these super teams come along. Uh, the Chicago Bulls. You get the parts together, and if you have four starters that are all-stars, you're going to be hard to beat. So if the Cavaliers are going to make up that difference. There are some people, we'll talk to Zach about that in a minute, as what the Cavaliers might do, what they could really do, and, um, and what we should expect out of the NBA season next year. <clears throat> we'll get Zach here on in a second, and um, we will see what he has to say about the, uh, again, the new Ohio State basketball coach and his impressions of So, um, Chris Holtman, Holtzman is the new coach, and we will be talking to Zach here. Um, Chris, of course, comes from Butler, where Thad Mata had come from. And so we had hoped that um, we would see. I, you know, I had my hopes that it would be great. Your call has. Okay, so um, we had hoped we'd see. Uh, Greg Bishop from, uh, and my personal favorite was Greg Bishop from Wichita State. And the hopes there um, is that he would be the guy, because he's been able to take Wichita State to 13 straight NCAA tournaments. He's got to the Sweet 16. He's been in the Final Four. <clears throat> and he, let's face it, when we talk about Wichita State and we talk about Ohio State, I don't think we think about equals as far as facilities and recruiting. And um, so when we take a look at it from that aspect, I think that the Buckeyes did a, a pretty good job. So um, we will see uh, what's going on with that. Of course, as I said, uh, the, the biggest problem, I think, that happened with Thad Mata 
his staff was losing recruits. And and he had some health issues. And, of course, that became a problem in itself. So we were um, we were looking for <clears throat> a fix. Your call has... And um, Chris Holtman, while we're having problems getting a hold of Zach, um, I just texted him, so hopefully he'll see that. And uh, we'll give him a shot here in a second. But... Um, as far as the Buckeyes are concerned, we're, we're hoping that the recruiting will improve now, and, it, and it's really got to. Um, early on, Thad Mata was able to get Mike Connolly and Greg Oden in here, and we went to the finals against Florida. I think the thought was is that we were going to be able to move forward from there and become a national power, that because we got these two players in, much like Kentucky did, they were one and done that we were going to continue to bring these kids in. And, and Thad always had, uh, you know, an Evan Turner. He had a, a D'Angelo Russell. He had a one-gun one type of uh, philosophy, <clears throat> which hurt us down the, uh, down the stretch because we had the, the team with Jared Sullinger and, and then you had uh, John Diebler. And, uh, so... Thad was able to get some kids in here. We just weren't able to recruit on a regular basis. And we lost a lot of these kids to Kentucky, who has, you know, Kentucky is to Ohio State in basketball as we are to football. So, I mean, in that sense, Kentucky does get those kids. That's a fact of life. Duke has stolen some players from us. North Carolina's come up here and stole some players. Now, what we're hoping is that, Holtzman will be able to come in here and keep the Buckeyes uh, viable, and they will be able to um, contend for the Big Ten championship and hopefully get back into the national spotlight. Uh, <clears throat> I would suggest this, that it, it's very difficult when we look at it to get kids to come up to Ohio State for basketball because I think the first thing that Ohio State's identified as as a football power. So it's hard to imagine that a kid would want to come in and, and come to Ohio State when he knows he's going to be overshadowed uh, for a great amount of that time by, um, by the football program. And so hopefully uh, Mr. Holtzman will be able to come in and get the Buckeyes going here. Um, I did want to talk about um, a little bit where the Buckeyes are going to um, with football, so let me pull that up here. Uh, Urban's been out there, of course. He's been uh, toying around with uh, what, what I would say is putting together one of the best classes, and his most recent recruit, comes from uh, Tennessee, and his name is Master Teague. He is a running back who is a three-star running back uh, who committed to Ohio State. He was up in the air. Um, he says he was re really never um, questioning his love for Ohio State and wanting to play for Ohio State. The Buckeyes have him in the fold, and uh, he is very fast. Now he's kind of raw. But, of course, Urban always believes you can win with speed, and I think that was the idea when they um, were able to bring him in. Now, the Buckeyes also s signed out of Brooklyn, New York, Matthew Jones. Now, Matthew Jones comes from the same high school, I think Brooklyn Hall, where Curtis Samuel played, uh, the Buckeyes star who just recently went to the NFL. So another defensive lineman added to this class. And then I believe that perhaps the um, – the biggest commitment might have been when the Buckeyes were able to add um, the uh, Tejada Mitchell from Virginia Beach, who's considered a number one linebacker in the country. So I think that the Buckeyes uh, have really been able to, and I, was, I misspoke on Matthew Jones. It was Erasmus Hall is where he and Curtis Samuel played their high school ball. Um, so... Urban's quietly putting together a, a, a great class here. Uh, something to think about. Uh, Friday night lights is when all these top recruits come into Columbus. They turn the lights on and they have a camp there in a the horseshoe. Uh, that is 
I believe, July 26th. And I will be there. And I'm sure uh, it just shows how popular Ohio State football is, is you will probably have 40,000 people there. And it is actually on July 21st. Uh, you'll probably have 40,000 people sitting in the bleachers watching these young high school kids who will be future stars for the Buckeyes. So um, congratulations, Urban, and the Ohio State recruiting. And um, let's jump over to the Cavaliers, and I'd like to talk about them. Uh, I think with the Cavs, what we're going to see happen is – the first thing the Cavaliers have to do is they have to develop a plan to be competitive with the Warriors. And, and, and let's put it this way. They are, they're competitive with the Warriors. But in order to beat the Warriors, the first thing we have to do is we have to look at the bench. And when you have James Jones and um, Richard Jefferson sitting on the bench and Iman Shumpert, um, the, Ohio's, or I mean, uh, the Cavaliers have to make some moves to purge themselves of some of the dead wood. I would look at every game film the Warriors played, and I would see what people came off the bench against the Warriors and contributed and was able to be competitive or shut one of the Warriors down. And I would, any of those guys that are free agents, I would first pursue them to bring them in as my bench. Because let's face it, Cleveland starting five or six is going to win the East. What they have to do is they have to build this team to beat Golden State. So that would be my first thing is we need to get some long, younger players coming off the bench that can contend with Golden State. Golden State was a very long team. I mean, they, uh, they were difficult to play with, and the Cav Cavs found that out. Now, the next thing is to make the super team. And the names that we've heard are Paul George from Indiana, Jimmy Butler are the, 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 the big name potential free agents. Now Cleveland has a problem with money. And my suggestion there is Le LeBron needs to look in his pocket and see how much money is filled in there right now. Because LeBron, through other sports, now I know the NBA's different animal. It's, it's not on par with the NFL where they have the built-in parity, the way their system's set up. Um, it's not on par with, with baseball necessarily um, because it only takes five people to play the game. But I think that what we have to look at is sometimes you have to take a little money out of your pocket to make more money. And I think that we saw Tom Brady do that. Tom Brady has restructured his contract time and time again to, for them to be able to bring players in so that the New England Patriots can win. LeBron makes more money in endorsements than he does as a basketball player. So LeBron could take a little bit less as a basketball player to be able to ensure that the Cavaliers could win another NBA championship. So Paul George, Jimmy Butler could be, become potentially um, targets for the Cavaliers. Now, some other guys out there that I'm not as enthusiastic about, some people are, would be Chris Paul coming out of, of course, um, the L.A. Clippers camp. Chris Paul's good friends with LeBron James. And I, I heard an interesting comment by a former NBA player. He says, your first contract, you know you're not going to make a lot of money. Your second contract, if you're a player, is your big contract. And he said, your third contract is you're going somewhere to win. And you're willing to move your money around so that you can play in a winning environment. Cleveland is a winning environment. So would Chris Paul take a little bit less money to come to Cleveland? He might. That may be a realistic possibility. He and LeBron are good buddies. They played in the Olympics together. The one that I'm not enthusiastic about is Carmelo Anthony. Leave Carmelo in New York. New York deserves Carmelo. Okay, Carmelo Anthony does not strike me as being a team player. He does not strike me as the guy that would give up a cent to win. I don't think that's that important to him. I think Carmelo Anthony would be a me player, I think that he would be very difficult to bring in and create chemistry. Would he be willing to come off the bench? I don't think so. And so that creates a problem right there. Uh, another player who's played with LeBron, who I think 
could be had, could be a, a guy that would be willing to be a sixth man coming off the bench, would be Dwayne Wade. And Dwayne Wade, after a year in Chicago, has decided he doesn't want to be there anymore. So I think Dwayne Wade, to get back with LeBron, would come to Cleveland. And I think LeBron could exercise, hey, I came to Miami to help you win a championship. Now, you come up to Cleveland and help me win a championship. And maybe that would work. Uh, The unpopular scenario is LeBron leaves and goes out to L.A., and in the rebuilding of the Lakers. And uh, I don't know. You know, I think if LeBron does that, it, it's going to be interesting how Cleveland fans respond. I didn't really hold it against LeBron going the first time. I think I would be more upset this time around because he made it sound like he wanted to come home to stay. Uh, the first time he was a young player, we heard what that one player said, is that your first contract is... You know, you're not going to make as much money, but the second contract's the one that you're going to make money on. Well, LeBron's made his money. He has an opportunity. If he can win another championship in Cleveland, he can do something that hasn't been done uh, in a long time, since the 1950s when the Browns won multiple championships. So if LeBron can stay and he can attract a Dwayne Wade, a Chris Paul, um, you know, I would love to see... Paul George here, he's six foot ten. He's he's a guy that handles the ball. You could stick him out on um, Curry. You could stick him out there against any of the Warriors, and he'd be very successful. He would be a great addition. I don't know that we can make that happen. But the other guys definitely make up a difference for Cleveland. As I said, you make the bench younger. You make them longer. You pick up another piece. And the Cavaliers will be right back in the championship, and we'll see the fourth version of this game. So, with that being said, uh, in a minute, we're going to have Tim Fillinger on. We're going to talk about the best uniforms in baseball all time. And I'm going to go over mine before we get these guys on. And uh, I have a few that I really liked. Um, The 1970s Astros rainbow uniforms. Uh, You know, the... Everybody liked to see the Astros because they were bright and colorful. They weren't the best baseball team in the world, but uh, people liked their uniforms. The Arizona Diamondbacks black and red uniforms where they had the A, which has like a little uh, Diamondback inside it. Very attractive uniform. I think it's a, uh, they, they have some nice designs, but that, I think that's the best. The 1985 Kansas City Roy- Royals baby blue, which uh, George Brett war when the Royals won the World Series. 1971, Frank Robinson, Brooks uh, Robinson, of course, the Baltimore Orioles with their black and orange uh, was a nice uniform. The 1975 Cincinnati Reds, when they had their gray with the red and white trim, I think was a really sharp uniform. 1999, the St. Louis Cardinals white uniform with the baseball bat with the Cardinals on each end. Uh, That doesn't change too much. The Cardinals have pretty much stayed traditional for many years with that. And then the 1973 Oakland A's green and uh, trimmed in yellow and white and the white pants with yellow and green trim. Um, My favorite is the Oakland A's green uniforms. Uh, The A's won three World Series. Kind of grew up as a fan of the A's. Uh, Always liked the combinations. Of course, Charlie O. Finley came up with all these different combinations with yellow and white. Um, They had six different combinations they could put together, and so it was kind of interesting to watch the A's come out and play. Uh, So I would say the A's was my favorite. Uh, As I said, next would be the St. Louis Cardinals followed by the Cincinnati Reds, the Baltimore Orioles, and the fifth place would be the Kansas City Royals Blue. The Diamondbacks and Astros are the uh, get the consolation awards there, but that would be my top five. So we're going to get Tim on here, and we're going to talk about that. I'm sure, you know, uh, Greg Henning will be on with us a little bit later. I have a good idea what Greg's going to do. We'll have Tim, and it uh, be interesting if he throws the, the Cleveland Indians in there. Some other uniforms of interest. Hello? Uh, Tim Fillinger. Yes. Bill Rayback on the Sports Planet. How are you tonight? Very good, Bill. How are you? Good. I almost said Razor's Edge because we're usually doing the Razor's Edge on this night. But 
We are doing Sports Planet, and we're doing a little fluffy stuff, and we're talking about the best uniforms in baseball of all time, and I just revealed my top five to the uh, the listeners, and so why, okay. don't we, why don't we talk about your top five, All right. and then we'll compare ours, and uh, maybe those fringy ones that we left out that could be contenders for that, that uh, okay. crown. All right, sounds good. First of all, you're talking about a subject that's right up my alley, Bill. I know you're a baseball guy all the way. Uh, not only that, but ever since I first started watching uh, Major League Baseball about 50-plus years ago, I was always fascinated with the differences in the uniforms of the various teams. Right. Uh, so much so that as a hobby, I used to trace patterns of the different uniforms and then fill them in with different colored markers. <laughs> ah, very good, very good. Yeah, I, I had a portfolio of, of some sort. Of all your hockey. Do you have one of the Cleveland Crusaders? Uh, no, actually, I didn't get into hockey at that point. Okay. But I did have baseball, football, and basketball. Okay. Um, and I had all the home and road uniforms and alternates, you name it. Okay, so... And there weren't as many alternates back then as there are now. Right. Well, what we want to do is we want to, as I did, I narrowed it down now. Of course, um, one of the ones on my list was the Oakland A's of the 70s, and they had six different combinations they could put together. So uh, what I did is I, I picked the one I liked the best out of their six. So right. um, we'll, we'll try to boil it down to that. So why don't you start with number five on your list as far as uh, your favorite uniforms? Okay, number five on my list is uh, from about 1967, the Baltimore Orioles. Okay. You had the uh, combination of black and orange. You had the script Orioles in orange, trimmed in black. And uh, Baltimore for the road uniforms on the road grades in orange, trimmed in black. Right. And and their stirrups uh, were orange uh, on the bottom of the stirrups with uh, black and white stripes. And I, I loved, and uh, I'll let you know, my number four pick was the 1971 Baltimore Orioles. Okay. And, um, and I, I always liked their black tops, or their orange and white trim. But I really liked their cap. Their cap was, I think, unique, and it was very attractive. Yeah, definitely. And, and was that the one with the uh, caricature of, of an Oriole? Yes, yes. Yeah, okay. As yeah. opposed to the earlier version uh, with the, the real-life Oriole. Right. This was uh, the caricature. Um, was, it was uh, uh, the middle section of the hat was white, and then they had the black and orange Oriole face on there with a, a baseball cap right. on. And uh, I really thought that that was an attractive uniform. And... Uh, one thing we don't factor into it as adults is we have to think about kids, and I think kids took to that kind of uh, logo that they used at that time. So um, my number four was the Orioles, and of course you've got them at number five. Uh, what about the number four team uh, on your okay. list? My number four team on the list is uh, the New York Mets. Okay, and I'll, I'll break this down for you. A lot of people aren't aware that at one time there were three Major League Baseball teams in the city of New York. Mm -hmm. You had the uh, New York Yankees, of course. You had the Brooklyn Dodgers and the New York Giants. True. Yep. And, and, and then when uh, the Dodgers and the Giants moved to the West Coast, in the late 50s, uh, New York City was reduced to one team. Uh, the uh, Mets, of course, were a uh, franchise that started playing in 1962. Yes. And the most interesting thing about the Mets uniform that I really like is they combined facets of all three of the former New York teams. I did not know that. Yeah, they had the pinstripes on their home uniforms. Uh, in honor of the Yankees. Right. Uh, the shade of blue that they wore on their sleeves and their stirrups and hat was reminiscent of the Dodger blue. Right. 
and then the orange trim that they had around their lettering and numbering was a tribute to the uh, New York Giants, mm -hmm. as well as the, the uh, style of NY on their hats uh, that also mimicked the Giants. And they do have a nice-looking uniform. I mean, no doubt about it. Um, and, and something that a lot of people don't know, um, especially our younger fans, is what the uh, what Mets means. I don't think yes. a lot of them know what that is. Yeah, New York Metropolitans. Exactly, exactly. And, and uh, in basketball, the New York Knicks are the New York Knickerbockers. Yes, and I think you would have to explain to most people what a metropolitan was, by the way. So. Yes, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so the Mets come in number four. Um, I do not have the Mets on my list, but they were on my initial list when I was going down the divisions and taking teams out. I do, I do agree that the Mets have a, a, a nice, attractive uniform there. What about number three? Uh, number three for me is uh, a classic, I think, and it's the St. Louis Cardinals. Okay. I uh, always uh, really liked uh, the front of their uniforms with the baseball bat and the Cardinals sitting on the on the bat. Yep. yep. As well as their uh, red, uh, white, and blue color combination, and they were one of the few teams with uh, stripes on their stirrups. Right. Uh, yeah, I. I got to go with you. They were my number two, Tim. I went with oh, the okay. uh, St. Louis Cardinals white with the baseball bat with the Cardinals sitting on each end and the script Cardinals on it. Um, you know, I it's a great uniform, and it, it's a time-tested uniform with the Cardinals because they have not really changed a whole lot over the years. Sure. They, they have not. You're right. As a matter of fact, uh, one of the classy things about their uniform also is the uh, classy S. T L uh, emblem on their hand. Yep. I just think that uh, denotes the Cardinals. Yeah. Well, and and definitely right there with the Yankees is one of the uh, most legend legendary uh, baseball programs of all time. But yeah, I agree with you that the Cardinals deserve to be in that top five. What about number two for you? Number two for me is probably number one for a lot of people. And that's the New York Yankees. Well, I know our next. I, I know our next guest will be the New York Yankees. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I mean, they're classic pinstripes, the classic NY on the, on the front of the jersey, right, and on the hat. And I mean, that's another one like the Cardinals that's been time tested. That uh, you you always recognize them. Yeah, I now I you know, and when I was in Little League. Um, the way they used to do it backwards of uh, Major League Baseball, when they would pick the teams in our community, the Cleve or the Indians team would always have the best players. And, right. And then they made sure the Reds would get the second grouping, and then the other teams got whatever. But I always seemed to end up on the Yankees. So I, as a kid, I was kind of a Yankees fan by default because I always played for the Yankees. But... um. But yeah, I, and you know, I just think that the reason I didn't put the Yankees on, in my contenders was that you just see them so often that they, sure. they just don't jump out at you like um, some of the other ones, at least for me, at least for me. Right, right, sure, and everybody's tastes are different, and we've got different reasons for why we like what we yeah, like. absolutely. Uh, and I, I like the Yankees uh, from the standpoint that my favorite player, Mickey Mantle, Played for the Yankees, sure. of course, and that's also why when I played ball, I wore number seven. I, yeah, I mean, and that's what we did as kids. I mean, we would, you know, go out there and take a magic marker and, uh, you know, draw a Cardinal or draw a Yankee NY on the white T-shirt, and on the back you sure. put Mantle and write, draw their number. Because when we were kids, you couldn't go to a sports store and pick up the jersey of any of your players. You you had to be creative if you wanted to do that type of stuff. That's right. That's exactly right. Okay, and so drum roll, please. Who is okay. your number one team on your list? Well, this is a personal favorite of mine. I always had a, a soft spot in my heart for the Cincinnati Reds. Okay. Uh, number one, because they're from Ohio, and number two, because 
they've had a great team on and off over the years, whereas uh, my own hometown Cleveland Indians, they've had a lot more downs than ups. <laughs> That's true. And, and with the Reds, I had a specific uniform, their 1967 version, uh, where they went back to the full sleeve uh, jersey oh, yeah. uh, with the pinstripes and, of course, the famous Wishbone C Reds on the front yeah. and the uniform number on the front and on the back. Uh, yeah, I remember seeing, I think it was maybe Jim Merritt, a picture of him in that uh, on one of my baseball cards, I think. Yeah, number 30, Jim Merritt. I remember him. Yep. Left-handed pitcher. Um, so, yeah, and, and I, now I didn't have that particular year for mine, but I did have the Reds in mine, and they were at number three, and I had the Cincinnati Reds gray, where they had the red and white trim on the sleeves and around the, the letters and numerals. Right. And, uh, of course, they had the solid red names on the back, which is, you know, emblematic of the big, big red machine of the, the early and mid-70s. Sure. Um, and, and and the block uh, Cincinnati across the front. Yes. With the yes. number. Yep. Um, well, now, I'm talking about specific years here, Bill, because there's a great website called Dress to the Nine. Dress to the A history of the baseball uniform. Very good. Dress and uh, you can nine. go all the way back in baseball history and check out all the teams from both leagues and uh, see how the uniform has progressed or, in some cases, regressed over the years. Um, if there were a, if we were looking at your list when you were trimming this down, who would have been uh, a couple of your honorable mention teams that uh, you considered, but they just didn't make the cut? Okay, a couple of them were um, the Detroit Tigers, uh, the Pittsburgh Pirates, uh, the Texas Rangers, uh, Kansas City Royals, and um, I had a fifth one. Um, Toronto Blue Jays. Now, you said the Tigers, the Rangers, the Royals. The Pirates, oh, and the Royals. Now, which, which year was the Pirates? It Was it the 1979 Pirates when they had the uh, We Are Family uniforms? Uh, actually, it was beyond that because one of my likes and dislikes about the uniforms, I didn't like the uh, pajama look of the uh, late 70s. Right. Uh, I like the... Uh, old style belted look on the pants, and I like the sleeve style on the jerseys. I didn't like the sleeveless uh, vest style myself. Right. Well, and, and you know, one that was the 1960s uh, Pirates uniform is pretty nice, which is the kind right. you're talking about there with the sure. the black undershirt and then the right. the white and black and yellow top. Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, well, Tim, that is uh, well, that's a great list. Uh, as we three of those, we were uh, at least with the same franchises, not the same years. So, uh, well, we appreciate you coming on, sharing that with us. We'll have Greg Henning on. I can already tell you, Greg's number one before you even leave the air. We <laughs> know that the it's, yeah, it's going to be the New York Yankees, but All I'm right. curious to see who the other ones are that Greg puts on his list. Sure. Well, let me just throw two things at you real quick before you let me go. Okay. Um, I've got two that are tied for the worst. Oh, okay. And that's the Houston Astros with their rainbow glow uniforms. <laughs> and uh, the San Diego Padres, uh, who had uh, their uniforms that looked like a hot dog exploded <laughs> all over the front with a mustard <laughs> and ketchup. Yeah, the old golden brown. Yeah, that... Uh, right. Uh, well... Now, I actually had the 1970s Astros as one of my honorable mentions. Yeah. Oh, okay. But, uh, and I, I had the A's first, Cardinals second, Reds third, Orioles fourth, and then the Kansas City Royals and their their uh, George Brett baby blues. Right, right. My, my okay. Fifth one that was there. a nice uniform. You too. know, one that was nice was when Henry Aaron was playing with the Braves. The Braves had that uh, that white and navy uniform that they had with the, the sleeves were white, but the, the main body was uh, blue. Yeah, that would have been one of my honorable mentions as well, too. I had forgotten about them, but that was a very nice look. Yep. And, and I always preferred the show the stirrups look rather than the pants down to the shoe tops now. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't quite got used to that one yet, but uh, yeah. it'll go back. It all, always goes in trends, so those uh, 
we'll see those pants go up there uh, as as time goes on, I predict. I think so. Okay, well, Tim, thanks for coming on Sports Planet tonight, and we will look forward to talking to you in the near future. Okay, and check out that Dress to the Nines. Check it out. Dress to the Nines. We will check that out. So uh, that is Tim Fillinger. And uh, run Tim's down again is Tim had the 67 Orioles was number five. Coming in at four was the New York Mets. Number three, the St. Louis Cardinals. Number two, the New York Yankees. And number one, the 1976 Cincinnati Reds. So um, a nice list there. And, of course, we'll get Greg on here and... Uh, I'm sure that Greg will enlighten us with some baseball facts, too. Now, Tim had mentioned, and if you have time to check this out, there's a site called Dress to the Nines, which is the history of baseball uniforms. And so we will uh, hopefully... Hello. Greg Henning, Bill Ray back here on the Sports Planet. How are you? You know, it's always a great day when you can join you on the Sports Planet... It's a beautiful day. It is. It is. I know. I understand that. Hey, um, Greg, we are doing something that's right in your wheelhouse. And our last uh, guest, Tim Fillinger, both being really big baseball guys. And I'm not talking about dimensionally, by the way. I'm talking about uh, interest in the sport. Uh, although, oh, Greg, you, you've, been, uh, you know, you've been on this running diet uh, thing here for a while. Uh, how's that going for you? You know, I finally uh, broke the 220 mark, so I'm down in 15s, which it's been about, oh, 15, 16 years since that happened. So, Was that about 7th uh, grade? Upward and upward. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, let's talk about uniforms, Greg. Um, we're going to start in reverse order. Who would be your fifth best baseball uniform of all time. Now, what we did is um, we kind of specified the color, whether it be their white or if they had a, like a, or uh, perhaps a gray. Um, year specific, era is fine with that if there was a certain era that uh, uh, a team wore it. So what, where would you be with your number five team? You know, when I was first posed this question, I, I wanted to go through and I wanted to, kind of break it down into categories. I had the there's three different categories. The classic, which to me is the uniform that hasn't changed much over much over time. Right. Maybe some minor adjustments to be here and there. Uh, the retro era, which I consider the sixties, seventies and eighties because you had a lot of flamboyant colors and a lot of uh, different modifications to uniforms. Okay. Uh, and then the modern era. Okay. Um, and so when I was going through that I was kind of looking at it and now, these are my five that, these are some that just missed the cut, that, that are just out of my top five. Okay. The classic Boston Red Sox, okay. their uniforms are fine with. The Detroit Tigers classic uniform. Okay. The retro Montreal Expos. Oh, he drags out the oh, Montreal man. Expos. Oh, I, I, yeah. I have to admit, yeah. I did like the Expos. They, they're pretty fancy, that out. Yeah. Now, and then to piggyback off of Montreal Expos, uh, another one I just missed out was the modern Boston National, which are the now, you know, uh, Montreal Expos. But my number five uh, comes out of the American League East, and this was a very close one for me because uh, there's several of them I think could be in my top five. Uh, but this one, if it was the hat put me over the end, it is my favorite non hat hat out there, and that's the Baltimore Orioles. Okay. Baltimore Orioles. Now... When you talk about the Baltimore Orioles, are you talking about the one with the actual bird or the caricature that they used during the 70s? You know, they've actually come back to that hat in the last couple of years. It's the um, black hat with the two white front panels, yep. the orange bill, and then the oil hat on the front. That's, uh, to me, I think that's the, the nicest looking hat in baseball. Yeah, I agree. Actually, Tim Fillinger, we, and you'll find this... Uh, what, uh, fascinating, but we all have the Baltimore Orioles there in the, um, well, mine was fourth, Tim had them fifth, and you have them fifth, too, so the Orioles make, a, they could end up being the winner out of this, because they might be the only one to make all f uh, three of our list. Yeah, you know, it's hard to keep them out, because 
in all honesty, if they weren't in the American League East and they weren't the <laughs> rival of the Yankees, I would have that hat. But I can't good conscience purchase their hat, even though I'd like it. You, you can't good conscience call pass interference on your shutdown corner, right? No, no, you cannot. We've been told at Ashland University. <laughs> Okay, so we got the Orioles. Let's bounce up the number four and take a look at that one. Number four, I think it's going to hit hard in the Cincinnati area because this is a hated team. Uh, really. But when you look at their uniform and you look at their baseball bat that's like diagonally across the chest and you see those two red cardinals sitting on either end of the bat, uh, it's just a classic look. If you have the red hat with the interlocking SPL, I'm going to have to go with the St. Louis Cardinals. And, and again, Tim Fillinger has them at three, and I had them at number two. So the Cardinals, for very much the same reason, I think the Cardinals, as Tim and I talked about, have, you know, much like these, they really haven't changed a lot over the years. They have been uh, pretty consistent with their logo and, and their style. Yeah, really, the only that's changed with them is they used to have the black hat with the red SPL. Uh, and now they're in the red hat with the white SPL, but they also have that black and red combination as an alternate hat. Um, and one of the few things that's changed with them over the years is, is just the length of the shirt sleeve. Back right. in the 60s, you know, when the Reds had the short sleeve, the shorter short sleeves, and the right. Cardinals had the same thing. And uh, really, other than that, there hasn't been a whole lot of modification to that uniform. Right. Okay. Number three. Number three. Um, this is a retro one. Uh, and this team in the 70s had all kinds of different combinations of hats, whether it's a pillbox box hat or some kind of gold hat. Uh, it wasn't quite the yellow that they have now, but the uniforms that the Pittsburgh Pirates wore when they had Roberto Clemente, that kind of off-white uniform, and the, uh, the black hat with the gold bill, the true gold, and the gold piece of the Pirates. I think those are some pretty snazzy uniforms. Now you're talking about the early 70s then, when Clement yeah. was playing? Yeah. Um, now, they did make Tim's, although Tim was more of the 1960s, you know, with the, the black undershirt and the sleeveless top, He they made his honorable mention on his list, but uh, uh, he did have them on there, and of course, if they're from Pittsburgh, I didn't have them on my list, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so what about number two? Number two, now, keep in mind, all these uniforms that I picked, I only went with their home uniform. I didn't go with their alternate. I didn't go with the road uniform. The road uniforms are pretty predominantly gray for all the teams. Right. Um, but my number two uniform is also a retro uniform. And um, Riley Fickers was at uh, the All-Star Festival of Cincinnati a couple years ago. And a buddy of mine, you know, then Corbin Kaplan, who also has a hand up on my stack. So he, of course, wanted to go and beat Riley. And we were talking, and my buddy had on this old retro San Diego Padres uniform, the, the yellow and brown, the mustard one. And we were talking to Riley, and Riley said, I said, that is the ugliest jersey that any team made me wear. And he said, you know, kids love it today because the girls were hideous. But you know what? They're paying my salary. I'll go out there whatever they want me to win. So I'm going with the retro San Diego Padres, late 60s, early 70s, brown, wow. yellow. And they actually continued that into the 80s when Tony Gwynn was uh, beginning his career. And, and, and now Tim Fillinger picked them as his uh, absolute worst. <laughs> he called them the hot. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that's the thing. They're so off. They're so ugly. It's like they're, they're iconic. When you look at them, yeah. I get, they stand out. And it, it, Tim's right. They're ugly. <laughs> they're so ugly, they're cool. <laughs> you, got, you got it there, because that's what kids would do. If, if it was ugly, they would probably go out and buy them because it would draw attention to them. You know, and that's the one thing about Major League Baseball. They've been hard to make changes over the years that we've discussed. But the one thing they've realized in the last decade is, you know what, kids today love these old retro jerseys, and they're making a killing off your kids buying these old ugly, hideous uniform, right. and they just love them. Yep, yep, I see that. Well, Greg, we already know who your number one is, so we're not going to ask you, but... <laughs> That's uh, true, and you know what? I was talking to my girlfriend about this, and she said her exact quote was, 
why would they ask you? They already know what you're going to say. <laughs> and it's true. And, you know, and it's not being a homer, but it's partly being a homer. But these uniforms are the timer. They're the classiest uniforms you will find. When you see them, when you see the white uniform and a navy blue pinstripe and a navy blue hat and that interlocking white and white, and you see and you realize that it stands for 27 World Series Championships. That is the most iconic uniform in all of professional sports. Well, let me ask you this. How can you go from that combination, and which is, I mean, at least base colors would be similar to the Dallas Cowboys, but yet you're a Pittsburgh Steelers fan. <laughs> You know, and that's one thing, the, the black and yellow combination I've always liked. And I said before, that's how I actually became a Steelers fan, is I just like the color combination. Right. But the, the, the navy blue and the white, it's, it's timeless. Yeah. Um, now, see, and, and Tim picked down number two. Uh, they did not make my list. I, it just because, now, I, I, I was telling Tim, I said, I have nothing against the Yankees because when I used to, they used to pick the Little League teams up in Cleveland, the Indians would always get the stack team, and then the Reds would get the next best team, and and then I would always end up on the Yankees. So by default, I kind of became a Yankees fan there. But I think the Yankees are so commonplace that I don't think they they stand out because you see them so much. Uh, you know, kind of the opposite of what you were saying about the Padres is you get one that's kind of an underexposed one because they were considered ugly, and then you have the Yankees who people see so much that they probably just become immune to them. That's possible. And, you know, when I, when I see just the hat, when I see that navy hat with that, that white and white, that, you know, I look and say, now that's a nice hat. That's a good-looking hat right there. Yeah. And, and similar to the Cardinals and the Orioles, really the only change that the Yankees have made throughout history are minor tweaks to the NY on the hat and on the jersey. Other than that, they haven't touched the, the, the design at all. And yeah. to me, that says a lot about the uniform when, when you don't have to make modifications or changes to it. It just tells you how good their uniform truly is. Right. Well, I would, I, I would say that um, uh, the Yankees didn't make, make my list, uh, but I, I do understand the uh, psychology behind it. Now, I know you'll be surprised. My favorite was the, uh, the 1973 Oakland A's green and, and yellow with the uh, white pants and the green and yellow trim on them. So. You know, if I wouldn't have, if I didn't go with home, only home uniforms, they would have made my list. Because I agree, when you look at those, and, you know, you think Reggie Jackson and the team that they had wearing them, or the players that they had wearing them, it's like, you know what, that's a pretty cool uniform. It stood for a lot. It stood for championships. And when they had the white fleece, that was a big deal when they came out with the white fleece. Um, no one else was doing that. And that is, that is a very classy look. But today, like I said, I didn't go with any of the real alternates or anything like that. Right. I went with a strictly home. Um, now, the A's did wear those mostly at home. But it wasn't their predominant home jersey at the time. Well, during the 70s, they had six different combinations. They had the gold top with the white bottoms. They actually wear gold on gold, which was they issued sunglasses as complimentary uh, uh, party gifts when you came into the stadium. Uh, they had the all white. The all white looked pretty good. Um, but, yeah, so, well, Greg, uh, that was interesting. Uh, it looks like at this point, we would have to flip a coin between the Orioles. And, no, actually, it'd be the Cardinals would be the overall winner between the three of us because, um, as I say, you had them four, Tim had them three, and I had them number two on my list. So it looks like the St. Louis Cardinals are the best uniform award for this year. You know, that's about a, that, that's a kick a little bit off the Cincinnati area. They, as much as they hate the Cardinals, they they're yeah. probably not real thrilled right now. And, and speaking of the rag, well, I don't know where to put them. Did, yeah. I put, did I put them in the modern? Because they went with the sleeveless and the pink stripes in the 90s. That's true. Did I put them in the classic? Because the uniforms, their hat hasn't changed a whole lot over the years. Right. Did I put them in the retro? Because there are some trendsetters with Pete Rose in the 60s. Um, I do like the red uniform. But to me, I think some of the other teams um, a little, little better to me. And even the Indians, I consider the Indians because of the, the old Chihuahua 
yeah. you know, what they wore in the fifties with forties uh, and fifties with Bob Feller. You know, those are some nice looking uniforms, also. Yeah. Well, I think if they were to, you know, if I were them, I'd just wear the Chief Wahoo in spite of everybody. But um, exactly. They they changed their Chief Wahoo because their original Chief Wahoo. If people have complaints about this one, ooh, they would really hate the, the first one. Right. Um, yeah, and the Reds, I did have the Reds on my top five list. I had their 75 uniforms, uh, their gray uniforms, when they had the red and white trim with the block Cincinnati on them. And, um, but they did make my top five. But, um, yeah, it, it is interesting, you know. Um, and actually, Tim brought up one that you might want to check, and you may know about this already. But there's one called Dress to the Nines. And it's the history of baseball uniforms for each team, and I guess it shows a uh, era by era how their uniforms changed. I'm not know that's in there. I'm going to look at it. I know there's another uniform that I can't think off the top of my head, but they go through and they have um, different uh, uniform combinations that they show every week. They have a new uniform that they show. It's really neat to look at the uh, the way things have changed. Even when you look at the Astros, you know, the Colt 45, I mean, those are some pretty cool uniforms, too. Right. Yes, indeedy. Well, we're up against the hard break here, Greg. Uh, thanks for being on the Sports Planet. We'll be getting regular with this again as we move, of course, into the football season. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. All right. Thanks for having me on. Okay. Talk to you later. Uh -huh. Bye. So, everybody, that is it for the Sports Planet tonight. Uh, we had a little fun there with baseball nostalgia, some uh, uniform talk. And uh, so we will be back, not next week, but uh, after 4th of July, we will start into our football programs and we'll start talking about conference previews and the NFL. And, of course, everybody's always ready to talk football as we are. So we will see you in a couple weeks. Good night, everyone.